satisfying lunch and you're ready for another fine afternoon. Uh, I'd like to introduce my colleagues and talk about fighting I.O. as a cold startup business. So this is a big focus, as you know, uh, Firefox 4, performance, and startup aspects of this. So take it away. Does it work? Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Um, before I start, uh, I would like to know how many people in the audience are not Mozilla developers. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> how many of you are developers? Awesome. So, uh, I'll be talking to you about... Oh. Sorry about that. Uh, about I.O., which is an unexpected problem on most systems nowadays. So, <coughs> I'll be introducing you uh, why we need to address I.O. somehow, and how it has an impact on, on software. Um, then I will introduce you how to actually see what's happening, hopefully, and what can be done against it. 20 years ago, I had my first real PC, one with a memory management unit, and it was fast at the time. But, well, PCs nowadays are really, really, really faster. Uh, processor speed by then was like the tens of millions of inf instructions per second. Now you can count in tens of thousands of instructions per, per second. Memory capacity has more than uh, yeah. 20 years ago you, you could count in megabytes. Now you count in, in gigabytes. Memory bandwidth was maybe one gigabit per second, now it's more like 200 or 3, 4, 500 gigabit per second. Hard drive capacity has exploded. Uh, my hard drive by then was 200 megabytes and it was quite big. Now you see terabytes. And uh, throughput is good as well because by then you, you had 1 megabyte per second, now you have hundreds. Uh, hard drive access time also increased. Uh, 20 years ago, you had a drive that had an access time of 20 millise milliseconds. Now, with SSDs, we have uh, 0.1 milliseconds. But that's SSDs. In practice, this is not true. Uh, most people don't have an SSD. So we're still stuck with very, very slow access times in the order of 5 to 10 milliseconds. So what's the problem? That's the problem. So on the horizontal axis, you have time. And this is Firefox startup on Linux. Uh, vertically, you have the disk. It's the offset on the disk. And what you can see is that, well, you read stuff, and you go elsewhere, and go back, and you're going back and forth all, all the di on this. And with really slow access times, it means that every time you have a vertical bar, it's really slow. And even if you zoom on the upper axes, it's not really good either. And even these or these are hurting a lot. I did a, bit, a little experiment with the data I gathered just before. Instead of uh, taking uh, the I.O. as it was, um, well, I did take both the, the I.O. as it was experienced in reality, and I also reordered to see the difference. And on the slowish disk, which is only 30 megabytes per second uh, for boot, the normal I.O. takes around 2.7 seconds. With the older I.O., it takes half the time. On a, uh, on a faster disk, around 
um, 85 megabytes per second. The order I/O is three times as fast. So it's really critical to have to avoid, how, uh, however possible, any uh, any seek on the disk. And <coughs> another point is that we don't really have a problem with warm starter. A anything that is CPU bound is not a problem. Why? Because you see, that's the Firefox startup. On a Core 2 du Duo uh, system, it takes four seconds to start, almost. And on a warm start startup, it's much faster. Well, under one second. And on an i7 system, the core startup is not really m pretty much different, uh, but on <coughs> The warm startup is twice, it's twice as fast, but it's not really a big difference because it's under a second. Like, and just CPU time used? Or is it's, that it's wall, time? It's wall clock. Wall clock. Okay. Time. So that's the time it takes to start <coughs> on, on call to do with slow disk. <coughs> So <coughs> you have to know what are the problem, what are the problem with I/O, and the problem is that at the moment uh, we have a lack of tools for that. Uh, there are ways to uh, track some kind of I/O, but it's really hard to have uh, an actual grip, <coughs> grip on on what's happening actually. Linux has some tools that allow to have some idea about what's happening, um, but it's really cumbersome, and I will show you some of the tools. Uh, and you don't, you can have a widespread um, knowledge of what's happening. And uh, getting relevant startup times is hard. Um, the system I used was a virtual machine, which I rebooted 50 times to get average times within some kind of boundaries. Uh, this is not something you want to do every day. <laughs> I, I, I wrote some automation tools to do that, but it's really cumbersome. And uh, yeah, tra tracking I.O. is also not really as simple as tracking read and write. You will find a lot of scripts on the net actually doing that, and it's wrong, very wrong. Uh, it's really simple because, uh, for example, if you open a file, read from it, close the file, open the file again, read again, and close it again, what do you think will happen? You have one access, not two, only one, because well, the system is quite intelligent. It's caching. You hope it does. Another interesting point <coughs> I discovered uh, is that CPU scaling actually has um, is influenced by I/O. Um, nowadays, the CPUs are not running at their at their sp full speed every time. And what's happening is that uh, if you go, if we go back, whenever that kind of stuff happens, the CPU is waiting for this, which means the CPU <coughs> is sleeping. It's at its slowest, uh, slowest speed. When you need to go back to full CPU speed, there's a latency that happens. Uh, because, well, the CPU can, can't really switch from slower speed to faster speed in an instant. So what happens is that if you somehow find a way to have your CPU maxed out during the startup of Firefox, it's faster by 10 to 20 percent which is quite impressive and unexpected. 
so um, together the um, the data I, I showed you before uh, the graphs on the disk I use ftrace which is a kernel uh, tracing facility in Linux which has the advantage of not needing anything else than the kernel uh, compiled with the, the right flags but usually distros come with all you need for, for that all you need is to uh, mount the debugfs which might or might not be already mounted depending on the distro and do some fiddling with uh, so here we just enable the trace on the disk uh, where everything will be traced um, we say that we want block tracing here we, we say that we all uh, we want uh, the um, block IO complete uh, events we enable and then here we get the trace the output is not really not really readable uh, <coughs> you have a lot of output which you don't really know what it means exactly because there's not much documentation about the block, um, block IO uh, tracing uh, facility so you have to guess uh, I used what I could uh, I just took what looked like was happening uh, there are some files in the events uh, directories you have m much more events than that but you have um, a format file in each of these events uh, directory which is supposed to contain uh, the, the, the format used by the output and it doesn't really match um, another tool that I used and I uh, will show you graphs just after that is system tap System tap is a kernel tracing Swiss Army knife. You can do anything with it. You can insert code in the kernel during its job. When it does, yeah, you can do anything with it, almost. You can trash the system with it if you want. Uh, I wouldn't advise it. Uh, the big downside of that is that you really need to know the, the kernel internals to actually do something. So uh, the graphs I did after that uh, required a lot of filling in the <coughs> kernel code. And uh, well, obviously it's hard to get the right data out of it because it also depends on how the kernel is optimized. Uh, because the kernel source is not exactly um, designed for that. Uh, there are many calls that are uh, from uh, static functions to other static functions and sometimes they are inline, sometimes not. So you can put probs on some and you can put probs on some others. Uh, it's, it's really a pain. Um, the URL <coughs> uh, I, I wrote there uh, is a blog post I, I posted a few months ago, maybe a month ago, um, about the system that setup I used and the script also to get this. Um, this doesn't. There's more than than the system that output here. But here is a, is a summary of all the I/O happening on the libzu file, which is the main uh, file containing most of the code uh, in Firefox during the startup, and the horizontal stripes correspond to uh, some sections, some big sections on, in the file. So the pinkish one is um, relocations. i explain it to you later. That's code. That's read-only uh, That's read-only data. That's read-only data, relocated uh, read-only data, and this is data. Hmm? Uh, no, the, <coughs> the blue. Ah, here. What, what's that? Uh, it's uh, it's something you have to endure on uh, on 64 uh, 64-bit systems. It's um, EH frame, which is used to uh, for um, to unroll exceptions. 
which is actually not used in Firefox, but you have to have that. It's in the ADB8. Um, so what's happening? The process starts, then you have some reads here at the beginning and at the end. Why? Well, that's uh, kind of an unfortunate uh, um, state of, of uh, the, the binaries, is that to know uh, what to read in the binary, you have to read at the beginning of it and at the end of it, which is pretty weird, but it's the way it is. It could be changed uh, by the way of the, of the linker, but at the moment, you, you can't do anything about it. Um, actually, most of what is there, you cannot do much about it, because main is run around here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so after initializing uh, libzu, here it does nothing in the file. That's because it's doing things on other libraries, similar things. And then here, you see readings here and here. And what's happening here is that uh, it's doing relocations. And relocations is something that is necessary when you have uh, random ad ad address spaces. Um, because the library is not necessarily uh, loaded at the same address, um, address in, in the other space. <coughs> so this means that you have to change a bunch of offsets to, uh, um, to, to, um, to make it work with the address at which the, the code is loaded. Uh, fortunately, you don't have to do that in the code because the compiler and the linker does a great job at it. But you read a lot of data and you also update a lot of data and you do it a bit at a time. So you go back and forth. And you do it backwards. Uh, here, it's forward. That's another thing. That's a static initializer. So, I think it's next slide. Yeah. These are static initializers. These are only examples. And for each of those, the compiler will actually create a function. This function will be in the, in the corresponding object file. And the result is that, well, you know, when you link a lot of your object files, you have a lot of object files. And each of these functions are in each of these little object files. So each static initializer is called uh, for each uh, object file. And it's done backwards because uh, GCC developers decided it was going to be backwards. <laughs> uh, the reason is that there are constructors and there are destructors. So you have uh, static initializers and you have the other hand. And to be safe with uh, object file boundaries, uh, they have to be run in reverse order from each other. And it was decided, unfortunately, that uh, those going backwards are the static initializers. So the main problem with that is that it's really easy to get static initializer without knowing. Because the, who would know for, from that, for, for example? You could guess here, maybe, but really it's something stupid from the compiler because this is a constant. And doing this, it will actually create a function that just sets this value, not the function call on anything, just this value to this slot. Just a function for that. Uh, here it actually calls something, so it's you, you have to know that well it will create a static initializer. Uh, 
Um, ice grind is another uh, <coughs> tool. It's actually two tools. Um, one was developed by Taras Gleck, and uh, one was developed by myself. Um, I, I took Taras's uh, one and uh, I changed it to, to do what I wanted to do. So uh, they are both Vibrite plugins. Um, my version uh, tracks uh, all the bytes, the single bytes that are accessed during the execution of a process. Only once. So at the end of the run, it will tell you each uh, what byte ranges have been touched. The one from Terrace, uh, you give it a list of uh, sections, whatever you want. Uh, what we use it for is um, taking, for example, the output of uh, LD, uh, which will give you a map of all your object files and functions. And uh, we list uh, all the functions, and we can know that way um, which functions are called when, in what order. But only once, obviously. So, what can be seen with uh, Ice Grind with my version? So the one uh, taking bytes by bytes is that uh, while the kernel actually reads a lot of data, uh, for example, text. The text section is the code section. Which, uh, so the red bar is the size of the section in the file. Uh, the, the green one is the read ahead, what the kernel actually reads, which is a lot. Uh, most sections are read almost entirely. And the blue bars are what's actually needed. And you see the code? Nothing is needed, almost. But you still read all that, which is a waste of time. Um, a bug startup is uh, um, something new that's coming in uh, Firefox 4. Um, so the blog post actually has the extension. It's a small extension, uh, a quite stupid one actually, only displaying the, the, um, the, three, uh, the three values. Uh, so it's tracking when main is called. Uh, it's not exactly main, but it's the main function in Lizzo. Uh When the session is restored, uh, which is when all the tabs are, uh, have been initialized, but not necessarily loaded uh, from the net. And when the first pane occurs, whatever it means. Um, uh, we also gather data, actual data, from users uh, through uh, addons.mozilla.org uh, pings, uh, those that you send when you want new events, or when it wants to know uh, if you, have, if you uh, are up to date. And uh, um, a real estate extension with graphs and stuff like that is work in progress in, in some bug somewhere. Uh, so we have a lot of unexpected enemies, uh, the file systems. Uh, for example, during <coughs> the course of the, in all this texting, I copied Firefox a lot, and it turned out that uh, files were mixed. For example, the, the, the libzool file, which is uh, 20 something megabytes, uh, you had a bunch of it, a bunch of another file, another bunch of libzool, another bunch of another file, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, the tool chain doesn't really help, uh, as we saw, the compiler uh, doesn't help here. Uh, static and dynamic linker doesn't help, and CPU scaling do doesn't help either. Uh, so what can you do about it? So we can, for example, do something about that. We can try to do something about that. We can try also to do something about that, but that's uh, something the linker should do. And we should definitely try to do something about all these, which are uh, 
basically most of the time due to call to system libraries. So what we have to do is, well, avoid fragmentation. Uh, we had uh, something for uh, Firefox 4, uh, the um, SQLite um, files for places, for example, were very, very fragmented. Um, and uh, we improved that by allocating by bigger chunks. Uh, reduce the number of files it was done in Firefox 4. Uh, before we had a lot of uh, different files in Components and Chrome. Uh, they are all uh, grouped in <coughs> one file now, OmniJar. Uh, improve the binary layout. Uh, so we tried some things uh, about <coughs> that. Uh, reordering, um, uh, reordering the, the object files, for example, which is uh, the easiest way to do that. Uh, without needing a new two, two chain. Um, reduce the size. Any, anything you can do to reduce the size will obviously save uh, some I.O. And avoid uh, going back and forth between files because, well, it's killing. So for example, so it's actually sad. This graph, this graph is kind of sad. Um, this is the 3.6 startup time, and it's actually faster to start than 4. Um, <coughs> so um, this is 4 beta 8. Uh, I, I did my data gathering a lot of time ago. So, uh, so without OmniJar, we see that OmniJar actually gives a, a, a good improvement here, but we are still slower than 3.6. That's unfortunate. But, uh, but we also have extension stacking now. So uh, it's <coughs> uh, instead of unpacking all the extensions uh, when we install it, we keep them packed uh, when we can. So uh, these are profiles I used with the six biggest uh, big, big users uh, extensions. Uh, well, only those that uh, work on 4.0 as well, because not all of them do. <laughs> so actually, uh, for ver version 4 is actually faster with extensions packed. And something stupid I did is uh, trying to reverse the static initializers, those that go backwards. I just hacked the file so that the pointers would go forward. And the result is actually surprising. I didn't expect that much. I, didn't, I did expect some improvement, but not that much uh, in the order of 10 to 20% just by going forward instead of backwards. Uh, these are the various uh, changes I, tr I tried. Uh, unfortunately, they won't make it except one um, to uh, forward O. So here we have normal, uh, normal startup. Here we w reduced um, the, the static initial some of the static initializers, but not all of them. And here, uh, we reordered the binaries uh, and packed relocations and, uh, and reduced the static initializers. So these are five, five sizes. So it's Libzool size. So it's quite reduced. <coughs> and the result in, in start time is actually deceiving for less static initializers but actually good for uh, when you put all of, these, uh, all of those together. So ha you have two blog posts with uh, more data about that. Uh, so the reason why uh, the static initializers are actually slower is that <coughs> when you stop reading here, some of the stuff here, if you stop reading there, well, some, sometime here, you will probably have to read actually. Because here, it's cached from the first arm. And here, it, 
you won't see anything new for, for these offsets because obviously it's already in the cache. But if you read less here, you have to read them later, which kills sometimes. I skip this one. So uh, what next? We'll also try to avoid FSync, which is also killing, uh, because basically it's telling the system to flush anything it has in cache that is not written. Uh, we'll also try to separate uh, hot and cold function functions at startup. Um, what will be tried is to actually separate in two libraries one for uh, the hot functions, those that are actually used at startup, and the ones that are not. Uh, removing dead code, because we have some dead code, and it's taking space, and it might actually be, uh, be read by the, by the kernel by mistake. Um, and preloading. This is a small experiment I did. Uh, I just preloaded um, all the library files from Firefox, the Firefox directory. I just did a cat uh, on that node, on, on the whole files. And it's actually faster to start. And the faster times include the amount of time it took to cat them to dev node? Yes, it does. Okay. So this is a three line change to our startup script? Exactly. <laughs> and the improvement is what percent? Uh, a lot. <laughs> okay, I can sense a lot of questions out there, but we're only going to take two because uh, we're out Sorry. of time, basically. <clears throat> Is the Firefox or Mozilla organization supporting you in this, and how can other open source projects benefit from it? Uh, well, anything that uh, can help will it help. Uh, I'm actually. So, can you repeat the question? Someone asked in the back. Uh, he was asking what can people do if, uh, if people can do anything about it uh, to help. So, yes. That's not what he asked. <laughs> he asked, are you getting paid to do this? Yes. And how can other projects use what you've done? Ah, okay. Um, so, yes, I'm being paid for this. I'm actually contracted by Mozilla. Um, and uh, how do other people, well, you can start to use uh, the, the code uh, we wrote, like Ice Grind or stuff like that. You can contact me. There's an address. I can probably give a hand. Uh, any feedback will, will be helpful uh, from your experience because you probably have problems as well. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have scripts, uh, better scripts uh, for system tab or x-rays or, or whatever, uh, that'd be helpful. <coughs> for the moment, it's, it's, uh, it's work in progress, so if you want to give a hand, you can. Uh. One more question over there. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, for example, the, the static initializer problem is kind of solved uh, in uh, GCC 4.6. Uh, it's not really solved uh, in, in the means that it still generates functions uh, for stupid things. But it groups them, which saves the day. Uh, there are other uh, things happening within the GCC. And uh, actually, Mozilla is trying to get people uh, to do some things uh, on the GCC side. Thank you. Okay, that's it. Thanks very much, Mike.